So, all right. Well, I recognize a few more people coming in at this point. So thank you everybody who's uh, taking the time to come out here on this rainy day in the Northwest to enjoy both the museum and our talk. Um, the nice thing about it is we'll talk about miniature Alfa Romeos today. We'll talk about miniature cars in general. So you can apply the same bad habit to your Porsche fanaticism, to your spoon fanaticism, whatever it may be. But uh, when you're done with this little chat, you can also go upstairs starting the rest of your tour. Just you know, surround yourself with Alfa Romeos and make yourself a, a wonderful day out of it. Um, trust me, I do that every day. So it's a, it's a great way to spend the day. Um, so again, thank you very much. Everybody who's online, thank you very much for joining. Um, again, this is uh, uh, it's sort of like I mentioned earlier, it's uh, like an AA meeting for people that do collector cars. So uh, I think there's a way to turn it into a good habit. And that's what hopefully we're gonna talk about. Now, whether that habit is uh, collecting alphas, which is my sickness, but there are people that collect a variety of things. And what we're gonna talk about basically applies to any of them, whether you're talking about collecting old oil cans, whether you're talking about golf balls, you know, some people do fishing lures, some people do fishing reels. The idea is, you know, it, there's a lot of fun things to collect. Um, the joy to collecting is that it helps people better understand who you are, because you're, you're showing, you're putting your passion out there on the line uh, to people. So think about that when you're collecting the cars. If you, if you collect a goofy little car that's uh, some little cartoon character, what does it say about you? It says you have fun, you, you try to, you know, have a, a kid at heart. Um, I'll let you guys judge what it says about me when I am surrounded by Alfa Romeos. Uh, the other joy is that uh, it, it does make me happy when I share my cars. When I have my cars on display, people come over to the house, burglars break in, whatever it may be, I, to me, it's, it's a joy because they get distracted by the cars and they're like, whoa, and they start asking about them. And it just gives you one more thing to bond with them on. So it makes me happy. Um, it also makes me happy because I have, what, a hundred of them upstairs in the display at the museum. Um, so it's a very nice way to enjoy your cars. So collecting has its good side. See, I'm trying to justify my bad habits. <laughs> Collecting has its good sides, and that applies to, like I say, any of the choices, cars or anything. Um, the other thing to think about in collecting, if, if you choose miniature cars, which I really encourage, uh, miniature car displays are, take up a lot less space than a full-size car display. The cost of a building, the cost of the, the you know, hiring people to manage it and run it and maintain them. Oh my God. Whereas you don't have any of that when you have a miniature car, really. I mean, you buy a display case or two. I mean, that's, so the benefits are phenomenal. Um, you don't have any license tabs fees. Have you ever thought about it? How much you'd spend if you had miniature cars and you had to pay a license fee? So the answer is to us Washingtonians, we're very key sensitive to license tab fees. None of them on miniature cars. So I like that kind of thing. Um, it just helps justify it because now I can have every Alfa Romeo that I really, really like. I don't have to decide where I'm going to park it. You know, I already have too many Alphas, and yet, man, if I did that in miniatures, woo, sweet! I could have them all at my house. So and my neighbors won't complain. Um, some of the other benefits, uh, you know, you can really focus in on what you want. But the hard part about that is. If you're going to collect miniature cars, uh, you cannot have every car. There's just no physical way, no matter how bad you try. And then if you're aiming for every car, of course, you'll be you know, upset. You'll be frustrated. Um, so you have to decide what you want to focus on. You know, try to, try to focus on Alfa Romeos. Hey, that's a good one. There's only a few thousand of those to go after. Um, you know, I, my boss collects Ferraris. So, okay, no problem. We have over a thousand uh, 143rd scale uh, uh, Ferraris. Well, the problem is just the first 10 years of Ferraris, there are so many iterations. If you try to have every single one, you are already up to 750 cars because they only made one or two or three of a body style. And then they do a different body style and then a different body. And so there's so many different versions. You can't have all of them. So you really have to focus your collection on exactly what you want to go after. 
And if that's, you know, Tony Schmidt over here in the audience may want to go after GTAMs or GTAs. He loves them. That's great. If instead he wanted Indy cars, he could go after Indy cars, but there's so many of those. He, you know, so you have to really figure out your focus. And don't, if, if you're going to choose Indy cars, go after like the, all the Italian Indy cars. There was only like 39 of those in, over the years. But if you pick Miller's, for example, Miller was a powerhouse race car in Indy. There was like 290 different Miller's ran. How are you going to do that? Well, forget that. Go for the Go for something that makes you smile, something that's within reason. So the point is, is that focus is absolutely paramount in what we're trying to achieve here. So you just have to decide what's right for you. So um, the, uh, uh, the next thing you have to choose when you're trying to decide what kind of a uh, collector you want to be. And, and by the way, not everybody makes these choices, sits down at a table and makes all these choices before they uh, started their collecting. So you, you start looking at the, the compilation of what you have, and then you suddenly go, oh, maybe I better start thinking this through. So it's okay to change courses halfway through. But scale becomes another one. And scale is very important because when you, when you look at the scale of the cars, a 187 scale is a very small little car. You can get a whole lot of them and fit those into display cases and hardly even irritate a spouse. It's amazing how many you can get. But if you bought you know, 500 different cars that are 118th scale, you got quite a few rooms in your house that are already now filled with 118th scale cars. So you have to really decide what you want. And, and don't, it's not based on price because 118th scale cars are oftentimes cheaper than the 143rd scales or the 120, you know, 124th. Yeah, there are more expensive versions. You go crazy and get the, the one eighth scale amalgam cars that are huge. And you know, you know they cost you $10,000 a piece. I don't think that would irritate anybody else in the house if you bought a few of those. So the, uh, the trick is choose your size of car you wanna go with and base that on some of the other choices you're doing, like what your focus is. If your focus was only on cars you've owned, well, that's cool because you can get a sampling of the cars you've owned. And if you only own, I don't know, I assume each of us have had 50 or 60 cars in our life. I don't know. Maybe it's just weirdos. But uh, if you have, you know, just the cars you own, 118th scale is not going to overload your house. Whereas if you're focusing on Formula One cars, you might need to go with that 118th, or I mean, the, the, the 143rd scale or smaller. Um, I focus on 143rd. That's my primary collection of cars. I make exceptions, but I do that because the quality is phenomenal on 143rd, uh, where it drops when you go to the smaller cars. Um, I have a sampling of some 143rds up here. I will make exceptions on the scale. Uh, for example, a larger Porsche right here. So it should be a, this is a 118th scale. Um, and uh, this exception was made because Hurley Haywood came to visit and he yesterday had lunch with Hurley Haywood. I can't have him sign the top of a little tiny car. So I have 143rd scale cars of his, but if you're gonna have somebody autograph a car, whew, pick a bigger car. <laughs> they will be a lot happier to sign a bigger car than if you hand them a tiny little car and say, could you sign that? Yeah, they're gonna be like, no, <laughs> give it back to you. So uh, exceptions are made. Otherwise, the bulk of my collection is 143rd. So I can hit the number of cars I want. I can hit the quality of the cars I want. And apparently that matches a lot of other collectors because some of the other people I know in this room have a lot of 143rds and a bunch of other people in this world have 143rds. Um, so there's a lot of choices out there. So scale is a very important choice that we have to, to make. Then what are you gonna do with them? When you start bringing them home, where are you gonna, where are you gonna put them? Uh, so if you go just with Hot Wheels cars, that's my hallway to my garage. Um, the walls are just covered with Hot Wheels cars, but each one of those cases on that wall is holding about 50 cars. And so I can put um, now quite a few hundred cars up there. And it just is great. People walk into the house, they go back to use the bathroom and they're like, never come back. And you're like, where'd they go? And you realize they're back there walking up and down the hall looking for cars that they, 
And they would never themselves have that kind of a thing, but it's enter entertaining for them. So, um, you know, you can have cases like this, just a curio cabinet, um, glass shelves, jam the cars on there really snug. You can put them on, uh, you know, spaced apart. You can have, you know, you know shelf units or counters uh, built, or you can have a storage container like this. That storage container is, you know, this, this wide by this tall by, well, I don't know, about three and a half, four feet deep. And so it uh, holds a lot of cars. So even if you can't display them all, you have them there. And so one of the sneaky tricks is if you think this through and you go, I don't have room to put up display cabinets with, for all my cars. Well, just put up a display cabinet that fits where it is. You got a storage area and then just switch out the display on a <clears throat> annual basis or biannually, I don't care. In other words, think about how you're gonna display the cars. Because if this is all thought through, you get the size figured out, you get the, you know, the, the focus of your collection and you get your display concept down, it's now a friendly, positive thing in the house. It's fun for people to come over and look at it. Luckily for me, I have it not only at work or at home, but I also have it at work. So it is a, you know, it's a, it's a 24 seven, uh, process for me. Um, so a little sneaky secret is uh, if you do glass shelves, if you actually get them slightly fogged, if they are, you can put a film on them or whatever, that film is phenomenal because you don't have to clean the car shelves as often. When the dust gets on them slightly, you don't see it on the shelf. When the, the glass gets film on it, a little bit of a, a, a filmy from the air, you don't notice it when there is a fogged look to them. And so I'm not trying to say, hey, you want a dirty space for your cars. Oh, I like my cars clean. I like the things clean. But every time you pick up a car and move it, there's a chance that you'll be damaging it, breaking a mirror off, doing something. So that's just a little professional secret here about them. I, I put a thin film on, the, on the, the glass shelves so that your eye stays more focused on the car, plus the shelf looks clean even if it's starting to get slightly dirty. So it is usually a weekend thing for me. When it, at least once to twice a year, I sit down and pull all the cars out of the cases, clean all the shelves, clean all the glass, clean all the cars, put them back in. So there's still a process. Anyway, that's just part of the process. Now, some people will go, hey, what about investment value? I mean, these things make any money for you? Yeah, no, no. Uh, there are a few select cars out there that will make you money, but it's extremely the exception of the rule. Um, of course, the, the top corner up there, the little silver car is a, known as Andre Marie, Marie Roof. A uh, great little modeler makes these uh, die cast metal cars. They're very nice. He always has proportions perfect. The cars are great. They're not as good as some of the modern day cars that are coming out as far as their detail and things, but the trick is they're collectible. People will pay a whole lot of money for them at times because they're limited numbers. As much as they go to the lot of effort to make this little car, that little silver car is a Ferrari 250 cab um, and only made six of them. So if you have one of the six, that's really cool because that, those things are worth you know, a few thousand dollars to the right people. You gotta be patient because the right person's gotta come along. But that's a really strange exception. And by the way, if anybody wants one, I have two. So if you brought your wallet, uh, let me know. Um, but uh, no, I only one's for sale. So you, I got to keep the other. The, the, the other weird exception would be like that, that bar, the Hot Wheels there. As stupid as it is, that Hot Wheels Beach Bomb, that was a pre-production one. And Hot Wheels put it in with the design was with the surfboards in the back. And they made the first couple of them and they tested them and oh, they didn't work. They weren't very well balanced. So with production ones, they put the surfboards on the side of the, of the bus. Ah, so the ones that you see people trying to sell all the time that have the surfboards on the side. Yeah, those aren't worth a whole lot. But somebody paid $150,000 for that little pink bus because it's the only one known left of the original few that were produced. 150, and to think about that, since it's at an auction, there were two people. 
who were right in that neighborhood because it, you can't get to that number without somebody else bidding against you. So there was at least two people in this world willing to shell out about $150,000 for that little Hot Wheels car. Extreme exception to the rule. The rest of the time you get your value by just knowing that you enjoyed the car, that you have collected the car, you found a car that was really rare and fun. Um, it is, it's not an investment. It's, it's, I just tell my kids, it's your job to figure out which cars go in which box. It's your job to figure out which ones are worth a little bit more than the other ones. So you can put these in a box and sell them for $5 a piece, first people get them, versus these over here that are worth you know, 100 or a couple hundred dollars. So, so when I kick off, guys, you're gonna have to take care of this. So, so I coach them, I coach them. So no, it's not an investment. It's just an investment in having fun. Um, but I would strongly advise another key piece of collecting is know what you're going after. Um, you want to do, do research. So if you, if you want a car, if you, want, if you see a, an Alfa Romeo Formula One car that's for sale, um, they don't always tell you who drove it. But look at the number that's on the car. Go look up the race that this car is supposedly from. And you look at the driver. Well, if that's the car that didn't finish versus, wow, you know, if you had car number seven, well, it, it not only finished, it got third place. I'm talking high and mighty because not too many alphas these days get for third place. But still, if an alpha is finished the race versus one that didn't finish, buy the one that finished. I mean, that's at least in my mind, that's the way to do it. So you do your research. The other thing is you can go on right now and do a search on Google, Alfa Romeo P3 miniature car. And on that screen, I can guarantee you right now on that screen, this yellow Alfa Romeo will show up. There's only one problem, and that is not an Alfa Romeo P2. That is a Fiat. It's a Fiat. Its name was Mephistopheles. It was a car that had a, a big, you know, crazy engine. And it, uh, it has chain drive and everything. And this was just, a, they did a weird yellow version of it and the, for the model. But it is not an Alfa Romeo P2. Um, and yet there's like, I don't know, five or six different stores will be selling this and to see it on eBay. So you don't want to put it in your collection and tell everybody, look at this really rare Alpha P2 I got. Yeah, it's pretty rare, all right. It's not an Alpha P2. So it's that kind of thing that you want to know your stuff because sometimes people out there don't know. The other thing is, you know, you want to find trustworthy people to buy from. So you think about when you go online and you, if you buy a car from somebody and you like the, the way it worked, and you look at some of the other things they're selling and you trust both what they're writing and what they're showing, I save that seller. Um, I typically then go back and favor them. I'm, I'm a little more hesitant once it comes to somebody else. If they just don't know how to spell the name Alpha Romeo, I'm nervous about it because you can tell they don't know what they have. So, um, so do your research. Well, that means you go online and do searches. There's also phenomenal books out there like this that is absolutely everything there is to know about Alfa Romeo miniature cars that are, are being sold. This, thing, this book is an amazing resource. There's also online forums that you can go to and there's people, whether it's on social media or just on their own website that talk about um, the, the miniature cars that are available or what they may have just recently got. I luckily have a couple of people trained who send me a little ping that says, hey, have you seen this? You can wave your hand back there, Bill. Uh, it says, uh, hey, have you seen this on eBay? And he'll, and it cost me money. I swear about half the time he says that, that car ends up in my, my collection. And sometimes I've done it and I go, oh, I already had that. Oh, damn, I knew I'd seen it somewhere, but at least I have it. Um, so point is, is that you, you find, you, know, you find the car you like, you do your research, make sure you're getting the right thing. It is as simple as they'll tell you, this is uh, the Alpha P3 driven at the 1935 German Grand Prix. It even comes with a miniature Tazio Nuvolari. The only problem when you look at it, it's a narrow bodied P3 and it's got the wrong front suspension. So it's not that car. Well, if you're not detailed oriented or you don't really care, then hey, it's a great car. But if you really are a detail freak, you know, you got a little, uh, you know, metal, <laughs> little issues going on. You want that exact right suspension. You want that exact car shape. 
And so then you have to then say no to that one and keep shopping until you find the right one. So point is, know your subject because it just adds to it. When that guy burglar breaks into the house, you surprise him in the middle of the night, you see him looking at the case, trying to decide how he's going to get all those out. You can say, hey, while you're looking, did you know? And then you start telling them about the car. Why? Because you did your research. You know what exactly you have. It's not just, oh, I love Alpha P3s, I got one. It just, it, it just adds that much more to the quality of your own connection to your collection. Collection to your, yeah, that, how did I say that? that? That's a tough thing to say, connection to your collection. I gotta practice that one. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm also nervous when I see a really rare car at low prices um, because oftentimes, as much as that sounds like a good deal, it may not always be. Um, so they found one not too long ago that was on that was a, a car I've been looking for for a long time. And it had the right price and everything seemed reasonable. But it was from a company in China that sold all sorts of crazy things, not just miniature cars. Well, the point is, is that it seemed a little too good to be true that this place would have it when all my regular car sources didn't. Then I placed the order for it at that fair price. And as I just finished filling out the, uh, the online ask form, it said, hey, you're a new customer. We're going to give you 50% off. They gave me a 50% discount. Oh, I'm happy. I'm sold. Again, seemed a little too good to be true. That car's never shown up. That car's never shown up, and it's been, what, six months? It's never going to show up. I just chalked that up as lesson learned. It was too good to be true. It is too good. <laughs> it isn't right. And no, don't buy from that company again. So the idea here is know your subject as you're doing it. It really makes it more fun. Even if you have less cars because of it, even if you only have 12 cars, if you know those 12 cars, it's kind of like knowing the oil cans. If your oil can is what you're collecting and you know exactly what th this is from 1931 versus this one's from 1918. Uh, know your oil cans, it just know your subject. It just makes it much more fun for you and when you share that with the burglar or the guest or whoever, they walk away with a little extra knowledge they didn't have beforehand. You might mention to the burglar also that they're really not worth that much. So <laughs> you want to steal something, go steal the TV. Don't steal the, yeah. Um, I hate to give too much advice. The burglar, the burglar talk is next week, I think. So. Um, so the other thing is just the fun side of it. And clearly you can tell I have fun with all this, no matter what, well, I have fun with everything in life. Um, but, you know, the fun is, you know, when you look upstairs in the museum and you walk up there and Bill can do this, Bill can walk up there and see those display collection up there. And he knows how many of those are his. He sees his cars in there. It's fun. He, when he walks up there and he sees other people looking, it's fun. And that same thing is at home. Um, the there's hand-built specials that are made um i mentioned well it was on the slide it said mini works and had a little picture mini works is a company that buys um somewhat you know they might buy a a hundred dollar car and then they'll take the time to cut the doors open they'll take the time to cut the hood open they will then custom build a little motor to put in there they'll personalize that car and they'll take that little hundred dollar car and turn it into a three thousand dollar car but what you get for $3,000 is, oh my gosh, it is just amazing. When you look at a car like that, it's hard for anybody not to be happy and surprised to see that some craftsman you know, has the ability to make all those pieces. So things like that, when you find stuff like that, it's fun. Um, you know, if you have a collection like you know, Bill has with, um, hundreds of cars representing a huge portion of Alfa Romeo's history. But when he still finds one that he doesn't have, one that he's been looking for for a long time, I guarantee you he's happy. I know that path. I'm on it. I'm on it a lot. I find something I don't have. I was like, woo. So it, it, this is more than just you're trying to fill the shelves or trying to tell a story. It's just quietly your own personal fun path. So. Definitely, I enjoy it. Now, this picture here on this side, this is an extremely high-end version. So this can be fun too. That is looking down into the cockpit of an Alfa Romeo 8C2300. If you have $100,000 and you want to build, or have somebody build you a, a model, 
That's what happens. They make that car, those gauges, everything on that thing is absolutely exact. If I was really cool, I would have put the picture of the real car from that same angle right next to it. And you'd be shocked at how you could almost not tell the difference. So that can be fun too, just to see the craftsmanship and capabilities that people have. So it is, it, it's, 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 it's a lot of good and fun to collecting whatever you're planning on collecting. Again, Alfa Romeo's, I strongly recommend. So if you're gonna do it, where do you go look? So there's sources. I mean, of course, I've mentioned eBay a couple of times. You'd be very careful on eBay. No, again, know what you're doing. But eBay is a great source because there's people from all over the world putting things on there. I'm, I'm nervous about some of them. So there's some things I just overlook. And yeah, there's good things in the junk on there. But you go on there and you create a search that is just die casts, toy cars, Alfa Romeo, and save that search. And then, you know, go in there and just look every once in a while just for the fun of it, see if anything catches your eye. Um, if you like something, don't stop. Keep looking until you see if there's anybody else selling that same thing. You wanna see what your options are. Because again, some people may scare you, some people may not. Um, there's also, uh, Wilkinson's is a great store up in Vancouver, Canada. So we can sneak across the border now, as long as we have our vaccination cards and we're being careful and following the rules. We can sneak across the border and go up to Wilkinson's and we can spend a couple months salary pretty easily. That's a store that is just filled with miniature cars. The store is a little smaller than the room that we're sitting in here, but it's filled with cars. Um, now you go to Europe and you'll find stores like this around places uh, around. There's a couple of stores in the UK that I frequent and places in the Italy that I frequent. And oh my gosh, you could, I have to buy sometimes luggage that just to carry back miniature cars because we don't have the luxury of those stores in the Seattle area. We don't have them in a lot of towns. So it's just not as common in North America. So wherever you're at, you know, you got to sometimes jump at the chance when you're in Vancouver or when you're in Europe. Um, but there are online sources as well. Um, there's also other things like, uh, Antique stores, I mean, this at times you can find a fun little jewel in an antique store. Uh, somebody told me about some cars over on the town of Thorpe in the other side of Snoqualmie Pass. And uh, there's that antique store that has big, huge words, fruit and antique on the side. And I'm assuming it's selling old, old fruit, but they apparently have antiques upstairs. So somebody told me about it. So of course I jumped in the McLaren and drove over there, just got to get the car out. I get over there and yes, they did have a couple of 118th scale Ferraris and things like that that I like. Of course, buy them and <laughs> drive back. So it gives you a good excuse to go for a drive, get out in the sunshine to enjoy the, you know, the world. And of course you can find miniature cars there. Uh, toy fairs, they, we just had a Hot Wheels. If you're, if you're collecting Hot Wheels cars, there was a toy fair here just recently, typically one to two of those a year. And there are people in there that are selling old vintage ones, fill in the package. There's people selling brand new ones. It's a variety. So whatever you want, that's your focus. You know, the toy store fair may have a few other things, but I'll bet you about 50% of it's going to be miniature cars, little Hot Wheels size, Matchbox size cars. Um, the uh, other one is specialty stores. So this store is filled with Hot Wheels. This is within um, almost walking distance of where we are right now. This is right down here in Fife. Um, there's a store called Savvy Boat. Savvy Boat started selling boats, wooden boats that you put in your coffee table or put in your waiting room at your doctor's office, which we all like to spend time in doctor's office waiting rooms. But if they had Hot Wheels, I'd enjoy it more. And that store has now drifted. So the boats are now the outside edge of the store and the rest of the store is Hot Wheels. Um, in fact, they have been so busy with Hot Wheels, they opened a second location in the parking lot that if you ask about it, you can get to. Oh, and now they're so busy, they've opened another one at what used to be, what was it? Something, it was a mall uh, up in just north of here, a couple of miles north of here. So they now have three locations, Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels, uh, green light, all the little 164 scale um, miniature cars. Just very, very cool. 
So it's, those are all things in, in uh, person that you can go to. But I did mention online like eBay, but there's also uh, stores, companies like Alpi Model, Mondo Motor Cars, Replica Cars. You know, these are all places that have phenomenal um, you know, resources of cars. So you can go to these and they're all online, great stores, very reputable. Um, and uh, so yes, they can, they can take your money, but I only, I only probably buy like two cars a week. So I'm, I'm, I consider that under control. So anybody else who says, you know, hey, you know, what do you mean? I, I've only bought one car this month. You can smile and say, yeah, that Fred guy, you know, at least two a week. So um, Alphas, again, my, my favorite car in the world. These are just some of the key names. These are some of the biggest names of the people that make Alfa Romeo miniatures right now. So, so Matchbox has the uh, new Julia. They make it in red, they make it in white. They also even just came out with a, a gray version of the new Alfa Romeo Julia. Um, these are fun and yet they don't cost hardly anything. This is a, a buck or two. You know, the, the base ones are only a buck. This is a fancy one. So it's, you know, two bucks or something. Um, if you can get to them, because if I get to the store ahead of you, trust me, you will not get to these. I will buy them all, uh, but they are there. Um, then uh, Hot Wheels has a vintage GTA that they have in a couple of different versions. Uh, uh, Tomiko has a nice Julia GTV that they sell. Tomikos are a little pricey. Um, they do pretty, you know, good quality, but they're like 10, 12, 15 times the price of what a Hot Wheels would be. And yet, uh, they're not necessarily better than a Hot Wheels. So it's just funny. But all these other ones you know, have great choices of alphas. They do, they, you know, they've been doing them for years. A lot of times, uh, you know, they'll come out with a car and it will sell out pretty quickly. So you have to buy it on the secondhand market. But they are, these guys all make great miniature cars. So you have plenty of choices between the, uh, uh, or you have plenty of decisions to make between, you know, the, your focus, how you want to do it, the size of cars you want to collect, the uh, way you want to display them. And like you mentioned the boxes earlier, uh, if your car comes in boxes, I strongly recommend you save the box. It's your choice. I do strongly recommend you save the box and have a process. Um, you know, you assume that you might get run over by a bus someday. So maybe you put a little number on the bottom of your car and a little number on the box so that your family members can go, hey, I'll put these together. Yep, that's out of here. Um, but the idea is save the box because a cars to collectors are cooler when they have the car and the box. So just from an investment standpoint, save it. Not going to break the bank either way. Uh, Hot Wheels cars. I got friends who have thousands of Hot Wheels cars and they open them. Every single one. Me? Well, no. <laughs> I probably have 200 open Hot Wheels cars. I have probably 5,000 still in the box and still in the bubble wrap on the card. So I have a bad habit of not opening them. So if you ever want to see me opening Hot Wheels cars, you had to have been here on the June 24th when we opened the exhibit upstairs because I brought, uh, what, a hundred or a couple hundred Hot Wheels cars in that day. And we had to open them all so that we had them open and on the tables. It was almost like I needed therapy afterwards just because I had opened so many Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars. Those were some of them were 20 years old and I was opening them anyway. So the point is, it's up to you to make your personal choice of what works for you, where your comfort zone is. Um, so all these places are your sources for finding them. And there's plenty more as you do searches. When you go on eBay, you'll find every once in a while a name will pop up you've never heard of. And it's like, who, who the heck is this company? But these are the, the main ones. So if you just searched up there, Alfa Romeo, and, and you put the name Brum in there, for example, it would bring up all these different Alfa Romeos made by Brum. You know, Brum may be a lower price than LookSmart. Um, LookSmart's cheaper than BBR. Um, some mini champs are expensive, some are not. You know, it just depends. Most of these brands make the, uh, you know, primarily 143rd scales, but then like the Hot Wheels, Matchbox, and Tomiko, they're smaller. Kyosho and others make small and big. So it's just, it, this is a resource for you. 
Now, bear in mind for everybody online and anybody in this room, if you need this list, you don't have, I don't expect you to write them all down or memorize them all. Um, if you jump into chat, if you're online and just say, hey, I want the list of car makers, um, we can send that stuff to you. That's very, pretty easy as an email. Um, anybody in the room here wants it? Yeah, just let me know after the talk and we'll be able to get you the same resource. Uh, it's all simple and trust me, when you live and breathe it like I do, uh, I'm on there looking for a variety of things and so many things make me smile. So I know these things, it's always at my fingertips. And when you look at my saved website folder, <laughs> three quarters of them are miniature car places. Uh, the other ones are all Alfa Romeo related anyway, but the three quarters are miniature car. So anyway, so that is the, the basic um, Fred story on uh, you know, collecting, collecting Alfa Romeos, collecting miniature cars. Um, and again, you can apply it to whatever collecting bad habits you wanna choose. Um, I just strongly encourage it to be Alfa Romeos, but uh, uh, I, know, I know people that love Mercedes and they love their Porsches and they have phenomenal collections. I just don't get quite as excited by it. So, uh, so whether it's golf balls or Alfa Romeos or anything, enjoy them. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank everybody for you know, fighting their way down here um, in the weather that's out here. I wanna remind everybody that on the uh, 20th of November, we're gonna have our next Alpha talk. That talk will be not on miniatures by golly, it'll be on a brand new, it's, a, it's a Alfa Romeo from 1938 that will be just freshly installed in the museum upstairs here. Um, so people that come in person will be able to actually see the car, uh, meet the actual person, that, the engineer behind this uh, project. And uh, that car is a 1938 Alfa Romeo 8C, but here's the tricky part. The S11, uh, Corto Spider has an S in there. That S on the end of Corto's is not supposed to be there. Corto Spider Speciale. This car never really truly existed. The S in S11 is for Sperimento. It is Italian you know, for the prototype engine they were building. So S11 code name was for Alfa Romeo in the mid thirties developing a V8 engine. And they had a straight eight that was phenomenal. This talk will be on this V8 engine that they developed. They made three of them. They didn't get very far in the development. They weren't happy with how it was going. They shelved the idea and the big um, fancy passenger sedans and uh, future sports cars that they were gonna put it in, eh, went a different direction, never happened. The engines got shelved and left aside. This car exists because gentleman here locally who's a phenomenal engineer found the engines all three of them um, and then looked at them because he's a phenomenal engineer and he figured out where did alpha go to how far did they make it where did they where did they stop what did they need to do to complete it and so he will share all that with us so it's phenomenal talk whether you're in person or online the trick is once he got the engines figured out, he said, I got to build a car that would go around it. And the car is one of the most beautiful Alfa Romeos you'll ever see. It's not a fabricated car, it's a, it's a real car. It's just, he used real Alfa parts underneath it. And the body is a perfect replica of an existing Alfa Romeo from that same era. The Alfa Romeo HC 2900 Corto Spider um, was, a, was a legitimate car. So point is, well, 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 well worth you know, sitting there and listening to an engineer who has to kind of reverse engineer. What were they doing? How, how, what were they aiming for? So, so anyway, thanks again for being here today. I look forward to everybody being here you know, in a couple of weeks and uh, we'll make this thing a lot of fun. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. An easy question back here? Yep. I think the real good craftsman is when I see that, then I Google it and then get all the pictures of every piece of color design. Right. That, you know, those South American cars, a lot of unusual cars you don't see. And I think the 
Yep. So, so yes, pick it up and look look at that research that you can find out to validate. I mean, the the Alfa Romeo Carabo, for example, may have only been one off and may have been in green, but you can buy miniatures of it in red or gray or other colors. So, when you see a rare car like that show up, if you Google it, then you just have to make your choice. Do you want to go with only the original color or do you like the red better? And it's just it's that's a personal choice, but at least you know it going in if you've done your research, like you say. So I agree with you, yes, do, do that little search like that. It also helps you realize if this person's asking you know, $300 for it, and then somebody over here is asking 125 for it, you kind of want to know what's the difference? Why is one worth so much more than the other? It could be a condition, it could be it doesn't include the box or whatever, but at least you know going in by doing your research when you, when you find a car like that. So I agree 100%. So that was another question over here. Yeah. Actually, Sarge, if you could repeat the question. Okay. In the that layer. That's a great idea. I will do exactly that. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, what was my what's my holy grail of cars, either that I'm still looking for, or that I have uh, acquired? Um, you know, it's tough. Uh, I pretty much have a couple of cars that are my holy grail cars, but I can't decide between them. But I'll give you an example of one. Um, and that is, it's been quite a few years ago, but I bought a, a BBR 143rd scale of the Alfa Romeo HC2900B. It was made by, um, uh, it was made by, uh, yeah, I hate it when people have their phone turned on. Um, uh, it was made by BBR many years back and it was out of production but it was unopened. No, it was still sealed up and had never been opened before. And so, yes, it was the most, at that point, it was the most expensive miniature car I'd ever purchased, you know, for that big, $800 for a car that, that big. But it was so cool because I'd always wanted a high quality version of that car. And this was as high quality as I'd ever seen. And it just, the fact that it was brand new and 20 years old was again, just beyond it. So that one was one of the, the Holy Grails of it. It shares the limelight with um, a car that's actually on display up in the case up there, the Alfa Romeo Nuvola. The Alfa Romeo Nuvola was a show car that was built. They only made one of them. And what was really cool is back then they painted it with a, a color shifting uh, you know, paint so that from one angle, the car was like a gold trim or gold color. From the other angle, it was blue. So that's extremely expensive, was really rare, was a new concept back when the Nuvolo was made. And so this unique blue shade and the fact that the color shifted was so awesome. Well, the miniature 143rd scale had that paint and yet made it pretty stupid expensive for that little car. Nothing compared to that first Alpha, but the fact that that car has that paint on it, it just, it, it just makes me happy because it, it, it connects it to the real car. I can't own the real one. So those two are probably two of the most significant ones that really are there. You, you'd kind of laugh at the fact that when I go on eBay and I'm going through there, I go, I got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, have, I have better one. You know, so you, I don't have too many holy grails that I'm searching for, but those two, they warm my heart every time I see them, just because I know how important they were to me when I first picked them up. So you can tell I, I get emotionally attached. Uh, my, my girlfriend wishes I would do the same when I see her as I do when I see those cars. But that's, that's a whole other story. She's probably online. Better check, back that camera up. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't know. I do actually like her as much as those cars. So um, yeah, is there any, happen to be any questions online? Sure. And has quality of um, materials changed over time? Uh, yes, I will. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, can I, can I talk to the difference in qualities between the different manufacturers? And have we seen much change in the quality over the years? And the answer is, the first one is uh, the, the model cars, as I tell my, my kids, I'd say, you know, if dad gets run over by the bus, mom's going to sell all the cars 
for five dollars a piece. So here's how you separate the good ones from the bad. So companies like BBR that I had listed on there, BBR has extremely high quality cars. The quality of the glass on the windows, the quality of the trim is really you know, high. The fine details on the wheels are really high. The grills, the lights, all that stuff is higher quality. But they may use that same mold and they put it out under their lesser brand and their lesser brand of LookSmart might say, hey, yeah, I got, I'll sell that car for 25% uh, or 30% less. But what you'll find is that the wheels aren't quite as nice because they're, they're doing you know, thicker spokes on the wheels. They're, they're changing. So, so the, the brands um, will have a distinct difference. And that price of that car is usually pretty, it correlates pretty well with the quality. So if you look at a, a mini champs car, you're getting a pretty good deal for a mini champs car because the clarity of the windows, the trim and the wheels are all high quality. The proportions are good. The, yet those are cheaper almost always than a BBR would be. Now BBR will give you a limited production run. So you suddenly have this exclusivity of having that car as well. But the quality is about the same in a lot of cases or very close. Now, the other companies um, like the, the company Brum that's on there, and there's another one that's called Best, and there's another one Yao, they make interesting cars and they're cool to be on the shelf. And sometimes they make something I can't find somewhere else. So I'll buy it. But the, the, the wheels will be plastic, big thick spokes, or the trim will be a lot thicker, or the glass will be thicker. So it's, you'll see it. So I, I advise my kids, if dad does get run over by a bus, you run to that case and you look at the quality of the wheels, the quality of the glass, and those get set to one side and all the others move to the other side. Because if mom gets there, she's jabbing all those. So that's the, the, the simple dif difference. The trick is, is in the old days, the proportions of the car were not as accurate as they are now. Nowadays, they do a much better job of getting proportions correct. Um, so, so over time, Quality has improved both in the finite details using laser etching to make the grills and make the mirrors or make the whatever may go on the car. That has improved, but so has the shape of the car, the, the proportions. Um, and bear in mind that sometimes we've picked up miniature cars and said, this thing's the wrong proportion. Well, that's because it looks wrong to you because you've only seen a full-size version of the car. But if you ever actually had the full-size version, you'd realize that, no, it's got weird proportions too, but we just never can see that. So, so nowadays, the cars actually match the originals, the correct, the real cars much better than they used to. Um, and so, and, and I think they do a better job of research on most of them, except that one yellow car I showed earlier. So yes, the quality makes a difference. It really correlates to price. Um, and the, the clarity of the windows, the wheels, the trim is the way to spot it right off. Then the second thing is the, just the fact that the proportions are so much more accurate nowadays than they used to, especially because in the past they used to make them out of true die cast metal. And that means they had to make a mold of some kind and pour that thing and finish it. That was harder to work with than the modern day plastics that a lot of our cars come in. The downside is plastics do with time, even on a good controlled environment, distort slightly. A window may pop from the car, the car shape might change. It's a finite little detail difference, but it is it does happen. So hopefully that answered their question with a big answer. <laughs> yeah, one more question online. Sure. <laughs> it's a quick question. Oh yeah. That person's crazy. Log them off. We want them off the call. Sell a car? Why would you sell a car? Bill, what are they talking about? Sell a car. The question is, why, where would I sell a car if I decide not to keep it? I have no idea because I, I, I do actually have an eBay store that I put on there, everything from books to weird things. And I do list the cars and I never just have a set timeline. It sits on there until it sells. Um, I don't negotiate on price. I just kind of go, here's the price, buy it or don't buy it. Um, so typically, rather than sell a car, I, and I do have a lot of extras and doubles that I buy or things I replace, I typically give away 
the cars that I don't want because it is a specialty business. You know, there's people out there that do it for a living. That isn't me. My gut feel is you just, people that come to your house and say, oh, I love this, this is great. And you say, oh, by the way, I have a spare. And you hand it to them and they're like, oh, damn, what did I say? But still, they, yeah, I give them away. Or uh, <clears throat> if it's Alfa Romeo's, uh, people can donate it to their local Alfa Romeo club who could maybe sell it at an upcoming auction or something. And that money can go to charity. <clears throat> I know that <clears throat> we do that <clears throat> here locally a lot. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yep. Well, yeah, very, very fun. So I, I appreciate all the questions, whether it's online. If there's any more questions here in the room, I'm happy to it. So the question being, you know, how did I start my collection? Did I start it as a kid? And, well, the answer is actually pretty straight up. I stole cars from my brother. Um, my, I was the, the rotten little brother. My brother, and we didn't have a lot of money as a family, but lo and behold, my brother had a paper route. And he'd go out and get Hot Wheels cars and Matchbox cars. In 1968, Hot Wheels were brand new. And he'd bring home those little red lines. And you know who has those now? That'd be me. I would take them at the time. And then he'd be like, ah, and he'd go get some more. So, but I also never crashed them. I parked them and I would drive them around and I'd park them. And it would show, it was very nice with them, which showed, it told you that in the future there was something either still wrong or he would just at least be a collecting type person. But uh, that was what started me. Um, and I, I enjoyed that. And I had a few random cars, but it took going into a store in Europe and walking into a store that is still one of my favorite stores in Milan and walking in there in 1999 and just seeing the, the amazing selection and the amazing quality that I just kept grabbing cars and putting them on the counter and I grabbed more and the guy's like, oh, oh, and he's trying to separate out the cars and say, no, no, you do, do you know how much this one is? Cause it costs more than all these others. I go, I don't care. I didn't ask price. Uh, and I mean, I was, I was willing to sell off my firstborn child because look at all these cool cars. Um, don't tell, oh, I don't think my kid's on. But uh, the issue is I, that was what really sunk the, the hook in deep was seeing those amazing selections I could, could get. And that was in 1999. And so from then on, it has gone to now I have uh, quite a few thousand this size and then what, four or 5,000 uh, Hot Wheels and then a few bigger ones. I probably have, you know, 50, 60, that size. And I have an amazingly accepting uh, spouse here in this world. So uh, thank you very much, Cindy. <laughs> so that, yeah, good, good question. There was another one back here. Uh, what was the most surprising purchase I had other than the one that didn't show? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I would say um, that, you know, there's been a few that have surprised me over the time just because their quality was, you know, a little better than maybe what I expected. Um, there's, there's been a couple of cars that I bought that the, the interior detail was, was phenomenal or the accuracy. There was a, I bought an Opal that was an Opal test car that was never, never, you know, a real car. It was just a, a mocked up to test it in, in uh, wind tunnels. And it's sitting in the Opal Museum in uh, Russelsheim, Russelsheim uh, Germany. And I've seen the real car, looked at it and thought it was really cool. And when I got the miniature, I was shocked at how accurate it was. They even recreated the fake interior, which is like a flat panel with a little hump where the steering wheel would be. There's no seats or anything. Yet they created that in this miniature. And I was like, that's pretty impressive that they would go to that kind of detail. And so that kind of stuff surprises me and it entertains me. And yet when I bought it, of course, I didn't see any of that on the picture. I just, I could see, well, look at this right shape. It's even the right color. Awesome. <laughs> and it wasn't that much money. It was a cheap car. And yet, you know, it's not the price that surprises you. It's that, wow. They went to the effort to do this little extra piece. So somebody was detail oriented and I like it. <laughs> so 
Um, the person, by the way, that asked that question is a person that worked with me at uh, Turn 10 Studios. And one question he didn't ask is, hey, Fred, how many cars did you photograph and add to the game while you were uh, at Turn 10 Studios that you now have miniature cars of? And the answer is, uh, I have probably 250 of the cars of the 350 cars I added to the game. So I knew you wanted to ask that question, but uh, I took care of that for you. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you already knew that one. Um, but yes, I, th so that's another offshoot of my collecting. You know, we all choose whatever we want to collect and why. At one point I said, hey, I'm photographing all these unique cars for a video game. Might as well find a miniature for each one of those too. And that's not easy when you're finding extremely weird and rare cars. Um, but hey, I, I have them. <laughs> They're on that shelf. And it's just part of the story. So um, I think there was, Bill, you had another question? Yeah, do you want to mention our YouTube? Um, yeah, yeah, OK. So the question is, uh, there's a YouTube video out um, that Bill and I made uh, a few months back that's actually on the Alfa Romeo Owners Club USA uh, Facebook page, or well, sorry, YouTube channel. And it's all about miniature cars. So if you go to the national AROC-USA website, it's got a link in there somewhere that takes you to it. And on there, we actually took a slightly different bent on the idea of miniature car collecting. We actually looked at each person's collection and we talked about their path and how their therapy is going. So, yeah, so it was very, very fun. So it was a very nice, uh, uh, different talk uh, than what we did today. So, yeah. All right. Any other questions? You guys have been really nice. Nobody's thrown anything. You got a good question. I know it's coming. Well, I'd like to say yes, but the answer is no. Um, I started a nice catalog of everything at, at work, all the Ferrari collection. Oh, man, I, that's all in a database. Every car, every number. And of my personal ones that came to work, they have a little FR on the bottom of them, but that's as close as they get. Uh, at home, I started cataloging it and I just never did it. So, but my homeowner's insurance policy is demanding that they want that because they go, we're not paying you what you say unless it's cataloged. So that is a great question. Is the collection catalog? If it isn't, you want to do it if it starts adding up because your homeowner's insurance policy will be able to add that as a writer and make sure you get compensated if the house burns down. And yeah, plastic models, um, they don't handle fires well. So yeah, but uh, did, hey, you know, the people online, I will show since the people here get to see this. I mentioned uh, I got to have lunch with Hurley Haywood. This is the handy dandy little car that uh, Hurley Haywood drove. And if you notice, it's got his, uh, uh, it's got his uh, little signature on the roof of the car. And if you guys ever get a chance to be in the uh, uh, Jacksonville or Augustine, Florida area, look up the collection. That's the Brumos car collection. And uh, Dan Davis is the owner and Hurley Haywood basically works for him. And Hurley Haywood drove most of the cars. Amazingly nice guy. And if you're there, say, hey, Fred Russell said to stop by and said, you get something free. I don't know, he'll buy, he'll put him on the spot, see what happens. <laughs> he'll probably give you something and send me the bill. So anyway, yeah, so very, very cool. So, hey, thanks again. The rain has stopped outside. So if anybody here has uh, already toured the museum, at least you can sneak out while it's not raining right this moment. Otherwise, go enjoy the museum and we'll see you in uh, a few weeks on November 20th. So thank you.